Partial funding for this program is provided by the Stratford Foundation. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The deal was struck 60 years ago. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia. You gave us oil and we will give you protection. Every president since has reaffirmed the arrangement. Over the years, both sides have benefited. Billions of petrodollars were recycled to buy expensive American military hardware. When necessary, America has intervened directly to keep the kingdom safe. They found the oil for us, and they've been our friends ever since. But there's always been another Saudi Arabia, one of fervent Muslim warriors, tribesmen with an innate distrust of outsiders. For them, the monarchy is corrupt, and the deal with America, a bargain with the devil. Saudi preachers ascend their pulpits to rail against infidels and Jews. Saudi citizens have supplied millions of dollars to school and train jihadis around the world. Oh my God, there it goes! When it became clear that 15 of the 19 were Saudis, that was a disaster. Now, Saudi militants have turned their sights on targets inside the kingdom and on Americans in Iraq. President Bush maintains that the Saudis are America's friends. Tonight, a special frontline history, House of Saud, the story of a troubled alliance. At the Al Yamama Palace in Riyadh, Saudi officials gather for a royal majlis. It's largely ceremonial, but speaks volumes about how this country is governed. It is presided over by the kingdom's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, a son of the kingdom's founder. To one side of the crown prince sit leading Wahhabi clerics, guardians of tradition who habitually resist change. On the crown prince's other side are the royal family and its retainers. Presumably, the two groups are partners in power. As male subjects come forward asking for favors, a new well for a village, or money for a daughter's wedding. They are participating in the modern incarnation of an ancient tribal custom. They are also here to enhance the royal family's image, to present the ruler to outsiders like us as benevolent and wise. This is government by patronage. There is no bill of rights here. Whatever the prince says or does, the tribal chiefs express gratitude and pledge loyalty.
أننا قد واحدا في وجه أهل الباطل والتشديد والأهواء Afterwards, they all gather to pray. The Al Saud family conquered the kingdom in the name of God and the Quran. Do you expect this to ever become a representative democracy? I believe that Saudi Arabia, in a sense, is a democracy as it is. Resistance to change is a matter of survival here. This is a nation in shock, where tradition and modernity are in violent collision. Few places on earth have come so far, so fast, as Saudi Arabia in the 20th century. ago, the Arabian Peninsula was a place of warring tribes. Nomads, sheikhs, emirs. Among them was the family of Al Saud. At that time, the Saudi Arabian kingdom consisted of tribes and small fiefdoms. There was no unity amongst these warring groups. The Saudi Arabian Kingdom was never united the way it is today, until the reign of King Abdul Aziz. In 1902, with just 60 men at his side, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud rode out to begin his quest for a kingdom. He certainly had a vision. He had a large big vision of what he wanted this country to be. He wanted it to be a nation and to take its place among the nations rather than to be a forgotten backwater where nobody cares what they live or die, what's happening there, but to be a player in the international scene. But to conquer the whole Arabian Peninsula, he needed the fighting skills of the nomadic Bedouins known as the Ikhwan. The Ikhwan, or Muslim brothers, were renowned warriors, light and mobile, and extremely courageous. They were also fervent Wahhabi Islamic Puritans. To recruit them, Abdul Aziz had to commit the family to spreading their fundamentalist version of Islam. The Ikhwan were an important fighting force that supported the expansion of Ibn Saud. They had this vision that they propagated true Islam in its purest form. So anything they encountered that differed from that vision was regarded as objectionable. The nature of where they were coming from, the desert, uh, was isolated really for almost 800 years. In the desert you have either uh, day or night, you have uh, cold or hot. You don't have these shades. Even the music is only one string. And that has kind of polarized the, the way of thinking. It's either black or white. Uh, it's either you're with me or against me. The first Western reference we have to the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood, comes from Captain Shakespeare, who was one of the early British explorers in Arabia. And he'd already heard that these people were fiercely anti-Western. Right from the beginning, this cutting edge of Saudi power was, was mistrustful of the West and lethally mistrustful. For them to, to kill a foreigner uh, might well guarantee their place in, in heaven. With the Ikhwan troops, Abdul Aziz captured province after province of the vast desert. By 1926, he and the Ikhwan had captured the jewels of Arabia, Mecca and Medina, making Abdul Aziz the ruler of Islam's holy shrines. It brought prestige and substantial income from visiting pilgrims. It was also a great victory for the Wahhabis. 
The Wahhabis took their name from an 18th century Islamic preacher, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Wahhab was first to see the value in forging an alliance with the able tribesmen of the Al Saud family in order to help spread his austere version of Islam. The Ikhwan were living out Wahhab's dream, and they wanted to keep going. They wanted more, and they just wanted to go on and on um, and attack particularly the, the British settlements in the north and Transjordan and so on. They wanted to create an empire extending across all of the Muslim Ummah. They would have, God knows where they would have stopped, maybe in France, <laughs> given the chance. So when Ibn Saud tried to restrain them and ask them not to launch attacks into these territories, they rebelled. They revolted against him, and they accused him of being uh, an infidel, of having abandoned the uh, faith of Islam and becoming worldly and uh, all that kind of thing. They said, why Ibn Saud sent his kids or ch children or so sons uh, abroad to London to this is against Islam? Why we had a new technology coming, wireless station, whatever, this is against Islam. If Abdulaziz were to stay in power, he had to destroy the Ikhwan. But how could he, the defender of Islam, justify going to war against his Muslim fighters? His way out was to win over the religious establishment, the ulama, who were regarded as the moral guardians of the realm. He turned to the religious establishment in Riyadh. He said, you judge this. Judge between me and the ikhwan. So they looked into the Islamic laws. They scrutinized the Holy Quran and the Hadith and found that King Abdulaziz was right. So they gave the famous fatwa, which said that the Ikhwan were wrong. They had no right under Islamic law to rebel against the ruler. So from that moment, they actually changed their role, the ulama, and they became uh, almost uh, like a force to be used to sanction politics. And that was the crucial moment in 1927. With the ulama's consent, Abdulaziz crushed the Ikhwan. The path was now clear. In 1932, Abdulaziz declared himself a king and for good measure, gave his name to the country, Saudi Arabia. To unite the kingdom, King Abdulaziz married a daughter of every tribal chief in his realm and produced 45 legitimate sons. Every Saudi king since has been a son of Abdulaziz. How many daughters he produced is unknown. They are not counted. Abdulaziz would not forget that religion and the ulama remained central to his rise to power. He became the kingdom's chief defender of the faith. But Saudi Arabia would have remained an insignificant backwater in world affairs if it were not for the discovery of oil. King Abdulaziz was aware that neighboring states like Iraq and Bahrain had great natural resources, but most experts did not believe that the fields extended to Saudi Arabia. Then, in 1931, they were surprised. 